All right, happy Sabbath, everyone. Well, it's interesting to have the opportunity to preach during this global pandemic and season of you know great political unrest, because as far as I know, none of us have ever experienced a more uncertain time, and many Christians around the world have been questioning if we've finally reached the concluding chapter of this Earth's history. Millions are wondering if we're living in the end times, but what do you think? Um, doesn't it seem as though we're fast approaching the end of time and that the second coming of Jesus is just around the corner? Well, I'm, I'm really starting to think so. And while we don't know exactly when the Lord will return, it appears to me that things are indeed lining up and that the world will soon be faced with tremendous difficulties which instigate the mark of the beast crisis. We might be the generation which sees these things come to pass. Now that potentially being the case, who among us is ready to stand during the time of trouble? For that matter, what would it take for an individual to come out of the great tribulation which is soon to come? Well, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to chapter 6 of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 6, 14 to 17 says, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Well, we know that this great day of wrath in which the sky recedes as a scroll and the Lord is seen sitting on his throne is the second coming of Jesus. So the question raised in verse 17, I think, is a very important one. Who is able to stand in the day of the Lord? Well, this is Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So the answer to this important question about who can survive the second coming of Jesus is given to us in these verses, which follow the end of chapter 6. The 144,000 who receive the seal of God are those who are able to stand in the day of the Lord. Now, of course, we as Adventists, you know, we believe that these 144,000 are the people of God from all nations, including Israel, who are alive on this earth at the time of the Lord's return. But I know that there are Christians of other denominations who don't believe this. Now, there isn't time for me to explain every single verse in detail, but I do want to share a couple of passages which might help you to better understand why it is we believe that the 144,000 are Christians of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 through 4 says, Immediately I, this is John the Revelator, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So when John was taken up in the spirit to heaven, he saw God on his throne, surrounded by 24 elders and the four living creatures mentioned in verse 6 of the same chapter. Now, 
It is from this throne room that John witnesses the events described in chapters four to seven of Revelation. And at first, this throne room, it seems to be somewhat empty. He sees God, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures. But by chapter five, the cast of characters begins to grow. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Well, we know who this lamb is. In addition to God the Father, John now sees Jesus. But the scene grows even more crowded as the angels join in to praise the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So the throne room is packed at this point and Jesus is being worshiped by all who surround him. We now see God the Father, Jesus, the elders, the four living creatures and a multitude of angels. After this, we see the seven seals being opened one after another, eventually leading up to the second coming of Jesus as described in Revelation chapter six, verses 12 through 17. And this is the passage we read from earlier, which raises the question we're considering this morning. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Now, as I mentioned before, the answer to this question is found at the beginning of chapter seven in which John first hears about the 144,000. I'll read this verse to you again, and I want you to listen carefully to what it says. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So you see, John didn't see the 144,000 in this verse, but instead heard a description of them. So what does he see when he looks again at the throne room? Remember, up to this point, we've only seen God the Father, Jesus, the elders, the four living creatures, and a multitude of angels in the heavenly throne room. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. So after John looks in order to see the 144,000, he describes this great multitude of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. He heard about them in verse four, but now he sees them standing before the throne along with God the Father, Jesus, the elders, the four living creatures, and a multitude of angels. Remember, the question of who is able to endure the tribulation and stand in the day of the Lord was already answered by a description of the 144,000. With that in mind, I want you to consider what it says in verses 13 and 14. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? And where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, the people described in this passage are the 144,000. These are the people of God from all nations who will be able to stand in the day of the Lord and come out of the great tribulation. Now, if this isn't clear enough, I'd like you to turn to chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 1, 3, and 4. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. 
These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. As John describes these end times people as the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth and redeemed from among men. So this passage makes it abundantly clear that the 144,000 are the followers of Jesus who will be alive at the time of his second coming and taken up to heaven. And this brings to mind what Jesus said in Mark 13 about his plans to return to our planet and bring his children home. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth into the farthest part of heaven. Now, the final detail I want you to consider is where John sees the 144,000 in Revelation 14. It says, they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. So you see, John makes it very clear in this verse that he sees the 144,000 in the throne room of God. And of course, this should remind us of what we read in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. Now for me, this settles it. The 144,000 are the people of God who will be able to stand in the day of the Lord and come out of the great tribulation. They are the followers of Christ of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues who will live to see the second coming of Jesus. This faithful group will be redeemed from the earth and gathered together by the angels to worship before the throne of God. And I hope to be one of them. I really do. And you should too. Uh, this is a very exciting time to be alive. Now, why did I spend so much time on this, though? Why, why is it so important for us to understand the identity of the 144,000? What does this have to do with our Christian walk? Well, let's take another look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So the reason I've made such a strong argument about the 144,000 is that it is them who received the seal of God on their foreheads before the second coming of Jesus. And this is an incredibly important concept for us to understand, since there are only two choices for those who live to see the day of the Lord. The seal of God and the mark of the beast. So what is this seal? Well, of course, many Adventists will say that the seventh day Sabbath is the seal of God. But if that's the case, how would you explain this quotation from Testimonies Volume 5, written by Ellen White, who was one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? She said, not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. There are many, even among those who teach the truth to others, who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. They had the light of truth. They knew their master's will. They understood every point of our faith. But they had not corresponding works. These who were so familiar with prophecy and the treasures of divine wisdom should have acted their faith. So clearly, keeping the Sabbath by merely coming to church on the right day is not the seal of God. Now, that would be very arbitrary. Uh, there's so much more to it than that. Though I'm not suggesting that the seventh-day Sabbath is unimportant. On the contrary, it has incredible significance and is the only one of the Ten Commandments that acts as an outward sign between us and God. It says in Exodus 31, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. 
So not only is the Sabbath a sign between us and God, but also a perpetual monument to righteousness by faith. It was designed to remind us each week that Jesus is our creator and redeemer. The seventh day was given to us that we might have time to reflect upon the goodness of God and develop a deeper friendship with him. So our day of worship, it's not insignificant or arbitrary at all. Just listen to what Ellen White had to say about those who refuse to keep it. Christians of past generations observed the Sunday, supposing that in doing so, they were keeping the Bible Sabbath. And there are now true Christians in every church who honestly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath of divine appointment. God accepts their sincerity of purpose and their integrity before him. But when Sunday observance shall be enforced by law and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then whoever shall transgress the command of God is worshiping the beast and his image. As men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority, they will thereby accept the mark of the beast. And it is not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men that those who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. So no one has received the mark of the beast today, but this is a very sobering thought. And to illustrate this point, I'd like you to consider the sign which God used during the first Passover when the Israelites were just about to leave Egypt for Canaan. Now, as you think of it, you, you probably remember that the Lord instructed them to take an innocent, spotless lamb, kill it, and then spread its blood on the doorposts of their homes. This is from Exodus 12. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You see, this was the Israelites' final test before leaving Egypt for the promised land. And a strict obedience to the commandments of God was absolutely necessary for their survival. In the very same way, the seventh day Sabbath, a genuine keeping of it, will be the final test given to humanity just before God's people are taken from this earth to heaven, the real promised land. But there are those who say, and this is even within our own church, there are some Adventists who like to say that the Sabbath is an arbitrary test of our obedience in the end times. But um, well, what do you think of that? Um, think back to what we just read in Exodus. Did God give the Israelites a meaningless test? Is any one of you prepare to say that the blood of the lamb is arbitrary? Is the blood of Jesus an arbitrary symbol? Well, it sounds so terrible to me that I, I don't even like asking that question. I think there's nothing arbitrary about God, nothing arbitrary about the blood of the lamb, and nothing arbitrary about the Sabbath, which Jesus so lovingly gave to us. When you think about it, the idea that God's commandments are arbitrary originated with the devil. It was Satan who caused Eve to doubt the commandments of God in the Garden of Eden. He said to her, you will not surely die when he offered her that forbidden fruit. But he was lying. So instead of siding with Satan, I would rather operate from the assumption that God isn't arbitrary, and that when he said he blessed the seventh day in Genesis chapter 2, he really meant it. I'd rather assume that there is a reasonable and intelligible purpose in keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. If this weren't true, God wouldn't have instituted it on the seventh day of creation week. He wouldn't have needed to remind the children of Israel who came out of Egypt to keep it before even giving them the Ten Commandments. If it were arbitrary, the Lord wouldn't have memorialized it in the fourth commandment 
and later chastised his rebellious children for neglecting to honor it. If the Sabbath were a meaningless ritual, Jesus would have set us free from it. But instead, he clarified its meaning and declared himself Lord of the Sabbath. No, there's nothing arbitrary about our God and his holy day, the designated sign between him and his people. So then how is the Sabbath connected to the seal of God? Well, what does genuine Sabbath keeping accomplish in our hearts and minds, which will prepare us to be sealed? Well, I want you to listen carefully to what Ellen White had to say about the seal of God. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. So you see, the seal of God is a complete intellectual and spiritual understanding of the truth about God. It's a right understanding of his character love and mercy. This is the theme of the Bible, that we as God's children would come to know him, trust him, love him, and be fully reconciled to him. This is why the Lord invites us to better know him each and every Sabbath. It is the day on which he would have us intentionally gather to remember his creative power, meditate on the plan of redemption, and contemplate his wonderful, marvelous character. So it only makes sense that the Sabbath and the seal of God are inseparably connected. It's all about knowing and trusting the Lord. Jeremiah 24 verse 7 says, Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. This is why the seal of God is described in Revelation 14, verse 1, as the Father's name written on their foreheads. It is a complete settling into the truth and trust in the goodness of God. So then this leaves us with a very serious choice to make about what we're going to do with our time. What then are you doing, brethren? in the great work of preparation. Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are just trustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. There is a work of preparation to do, and obedience to the truth is an absolute requirement if we desire to receive the seal of God. But this brings up the question of what true obedience is, and I want to read a brief quotation from Christ's Object Lessons. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer, this will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. God is righteousness, and true obedience springs from our love of him and his laws, which are an outgrowth of his perfect, wonderful character. True obedience is a joy for those who are learning more and more of his righteous, loving ways. But what about the work? of preparation we're to do before receiving the seal of God. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. 
It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Well, this is quite the statement. And if there weren't more to it, then I would be very concerned that Ellen White was suggesting here that we can achieve righteousness through our own efforts. Uh, obviously, this isn't the whole picture. And yet, even the Bible tells us that our human efforts are important in the work of sanctification. Uh, certainly, you know, it says in the book of James that faith without works is dead. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So how can we do this work of ridding ourselves of character flaws and sinful habits? How can we cooperate with God in the work of sanctification that we might be counted worthy to receive the seal of God? Well, when Jesus was on this earth, some of those from the crowds which followed him had the very same question. Jesus said in John chapter 6, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Well, it's true that we need to shun every sinful tendency and put forth legitimate efforts to rid ourselves of character flaws. But it's not a work we can do on our own. God invites us to cooperate with him in the work of sanctification, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. If we want to overcome sin in our lives, we need to believe in Jesus and become like him. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. As we struggle with sin and combine our human efforts with divine help from the Holy Spirit, Let's keep our eyes fixed upon our Savior. We will be transformed as we behold his goodness and love. No one needs say that his case is hopeless, that he cannot live the life of a Christian. Ample provision is made by the death of Christ for every soul. Jesus is our ever-present help in time of need. Only call upon him in faith, and he has promised to hear and answer your petitions. Uh, friends and family, it's time for us to be settled in the truth about God's character. It's time for us to finish the work of preparation and cooperate with God in ridding ourselves of defects. The time has come for us to obey his commandments by loving righteousness and beholding the glory of the Lord. It's time for us to deepen our friendships with him, that we might truly know and love him, having his name written in our foreheads. Listen, we are so very close to the end of time, and we can only survive the day of the Lord if we believe in Jesus and fix our eyes upon him. As the day of the Lord approaches, we need to be walking with him, reading his word and spending more and more time with him through prayer that we would be prepared to receive the seal of God. It's all about Jesus. And if you'll just turn your eyes upon him, he will keep you in his arms until the day we're brought to the heavenly throne room to bow down and worship the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I want to leave you with one final thought. This is from 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. 
He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Now let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath day uh, on which you remind us that you are the creator and you are the redeemer. And you invite us to know and to love you better, to be settled in the truth about how wonderful and gracious you are. Lord, I thank you that you are not arbitrary. Your commandments are not arbitrary. Your day of rest is not arbitrary, but it is a beautiful symbol, a beautiful sign of our relationship with you. It is a sign which marks us as yours, your children. So Father, I just praise you and pray that you would touch the hearts of everyone listening, that you would continue to open up their hearts to you. Lord, help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus and to trust you to take us through the great tribulation, that we might see you, that we might be sealed in our foreheads with the knowledge of how lovely and good and trustworthy you are. So, Father, we praise you and pray for all these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.